ओके verlangen naar die jare toe ek sondags ko um, sang moes lei na die sondags ko liekies het aksie by gehad en in die tyd wat jy klaar was was jy opgewarm en nou vanochtend kry ek so koud ek sal moet sê ons moet gauw climbing up the hill sing maar toe maar ons het seker nie die muziek of die woorde nie Maar is dankbaar dat jylle hier is, die van jylle wat die kouwe trotseer. Ons bid dat die Heere vir jylle sal seen. <coughs> It is a privilege for me to preach. I thank the Lord that I have this opportunity. Many years ago I thought I would never do. But now I have the privilege of repeating. Leon did half my sermon for me so long so I can do the other half. <laughs> We are privileged in this life that we're living at the moment to have what we have. If we realize the difference, if I think back when I first was born again, I had a little Bible about that size, which my father brought back from Egypt, where he was a soldier and he could carry it in his pocket. Many people told the story about how they got shot and the bullet hit the Bible and that was the providence. But some of the stories I wasn't so sure about. They just were trying to talk. But there were some quite remarkable stories. And when I was going through the preparation for this sermon, I kept thinking of the fact that um, the title uh, I gave incorrectly it should be a cleansed conscience, conscience. Sure. I've changed it so many times and I've changed the sermon so many times so if I get off track for a while bear with me I'm going to give you um, what I last wrote, and hopefully it's a blessing to you. Let us read Hebrews 9. <coughs> the last time we shared with each other, it was we finished off a bit on um, Hebrews 8. Hebrews 9 from verse 11. But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, he entered once for all into the holy place, not by means of blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood thus securing an eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of defiled persons with the ashes of a heifer sanctify for the purification of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God. That verse there is one of the most amazing I have read in a long time. And it seems like every now and again I'm seeing verses that I don't know why I didn't see them before. I see the power in them and the marvelous message that it contains. I um, just went through another book that I borrowed from somebody that was written in 1995. That's not so long ago. Uh, John MacArthur, by the way, is the person you know, probably most of you know him, wrote the book The Vanishing Conscience. 
I don't recommend it for bedside reading because it's actually very uncomfortable. At the first time I read it, I thought, yeah, this world's in a bad shape. The time I read it now, I realized the world is a lot worse than it was in 1994. In fact, MacArthur's long behind, he better rewrite that, but he knows that. He's coming out with a lot of other stuff. But the message is, <clears throat> all of you here know and realize what we're going through. If you're not, the Lord help you to understand it so that you can cope with it as it gets worse and worse. And I've been watching the news of late just to kind of keep my mind on what's happening. And sometimes I just realize the wickedness and the lack of conscience is gone. I mean, the people who are supposed to be examples, leaders of countries, are getting worse and worse. So you tell your child, follow that guy, you've got problems. You better make sure <laughs> that you know you pointing your finger at and what it's all about. Yeah, we have in the um, this message through the blood of Christ, through the eternal spirit, without blemish to God, purifying our conscience to serve the living God. A massive message. You go through this time and time again, get it in your heart and your mind, so that you can be comforted with the one thing that you serve, a living God. Amen. Notice that this is the triune God in one verse, including you. You see where you are in this thing? The purifying of your conscience, the purifying of my conscience is surrounded by the Trinity. And it's just amazing when we see what comes out of this. Now I'm going to jump around today. I hope you've all got your pencils sharpened. I hope your hands are not too cold to write. And if you've forgotten your pen and your pencil, you're going to have to remember it in your heart. But most of it I've referred to before, so most of you will remember. Because I always love to start in Genesis. Good place to start. That's where the Lord started. That's where Adam started. That's where the whole story started. And started with a great fall. But there's some great messages that come out of it. If you turn to Genesis 6, so Genesis 1, there are six verses that I'm going to refer to you. Well, I only meant for you to write them all down, except the first one. You can open up to there. Genesis 1, verse 26. Now, the reason I've given you the others is that you can check what's happening. This is not a once-off story that happened in Genesis and that everybody has forgotten about and that wasn't really important. In fact, this story is one of the most vital that hit the world. You talk about a crash or a disaster. This is what we found in Genesis. Now look at Genesis 1 and verse 26. And 27. 27 is the one we're going to focus on and that we're going to pass on to our other verses. Now the other verses will be we're not going to read them, but if you want to cross-check it, Genesis 5, 1, 9, 6, and then we get into the New Testament. And that's why what it's important, because from Genesis all the way to 1 Corinthians 11, 7, and James, seems kind of strange that James would have it, James 3, 9, all of them cover this message from the real, the real happening and how it will develop towards the end of the coming and why we need to be excited about it. Verse seven, 27, 
in chapter 1 of Genesis says, So God created man in his own image. Male and female created he them. Have you ever sat back and really thought about it or give it a study? What does that mean in his own image? And that's what these other verses say. It wasn't just Adam and Eve. That own image is in you. You might not believe it, but if you study it, you'll find out what is it of that image of God which he created man in and then he passed it on to us with. God made man and woman in his own image. Packer, J.I. Packer gives us a concise, his brilliant and concise theology. But I'm going to cover just a few of the terms he uses so that you can just get a latch on what this means if you haven't had a time to actually think through it. Packer gives the ideas, firstly, the existence of a soul or a spirit that as a personal and self-conscious with a godlike capacity for knowledge, thought, and action. You've got that. You know you've got that. Where else would you have got it from but from God? And he has seen that it goes through each generation. The other point, being morally upright. And it doesn't sound like it fits in our generation anymore. But that's what God placed on us. That we would be morally upright if we're in his image. A quality lost at the fall, but now being progressively restored. You, you, you must look around you and think about that. In your own heart, are we being progressively restored in Christ see Ephesians 4 24 I'll give you a minute to go there because that well Leon's going to preach on that next time so I'm going to take a bit of his sermon this time <laughs> Ephesians 4 24 put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. That's what we're developing. We are putting on. We're being encouraged to have in our bodies. Ephesians gives you a lot of that putting on of. The other point he makes is dominion over environment. The human body as the means through which we experience reality. Reality. The God-given capacity for eternal life. Those are the things that he covers in what is God's image. There are other ways that other people have defined it. We will develop it slightly, but I want to focus on one or two of the most important parts. Our, our text in Hebrews, we will read it over and over to help us get it appreciated but the thing that I want to emphasize how much more will the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish purify our conscience you've got a conscience do you know where you got it Opa Adam but he got it from God and you've been carrying that conscience. I don't know if you've noticed it. You still have a conscience? I'm sure you have a conscience. But some of us have got to the stage where we have a selective conscience. Or we use the conscience when it suits us. Or we get into a state of panic when we find that we go, it's going rough and then the conscience helps us. To some extent. Just a little bit of info on the conscience. The first one I gave you was about 
the image. The same author of that helps us to understand conscience better. I'm going to just read two bits of passages from Packer again, Conscience and the Law. Conscience is the built-in power of our minds to pass moral judgments on ourselves. Not on Bhuti or Sisi or everybody else, on ourselves. Approving or disapproving our actions, thoughts and plans and telling us if what we have done is assessed as wrong, that we deserve to suffer for it. Concluding at the end of this long session is given here. The New Testament, uh, Testament ideal is a conscience free from guilt and able to guide us in the holy direction. The conscience can only be freed from guilt by the power of Christ's blood, once freed and protected in its freedom by the gift of justification. The conscience is able to grow through the teaching of Scripture and the means of grace in Christ, in, in Christian life. quite amazing that we have thoughts that we have to we will see that God put his laws in our minds as in the text which we finished with last time in this chapter just before what we're working with now we find in Hebrews 8.10 we see that God put his laws in our minds and wrote them in our hearts our covenant God has, is, and will be restoring his people of all nations back to his image. See how these things come together. God gave us an image, God's image. God gives us the law put into our minds and our hearts. A lot of people think they're responsible for what you know. If you know the truth, you got it from God, you got it from His Word, from Genesis throughout. If you're coming to church, you should be getting the Word of God. And that is what the message of these are. Your image which is vitally important, which is being restored by God through His Word, is also through His Word putting the message in your heart and mind. He's working on you all the time. The God triune, Jesus, the Holy Spirit and the Father are all working on you and your conscience, as this testimony said. So if your conscience is working, praise the Lord. If it's not working, pray to the Lord. That your mind gets into gear with what He has in mind for you. So that you can hear what He wants to tell you. So that you hear what He is telling you. And you pay attention and use what He gives you. Romans 2.15 says, They show that the work of the law is written on the hearts, while their conscience also bears witness, and their conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse them. Here's the whole thing wrapped up in one verse. Romans 2.15 You're sitting in a court case every day of your life. I don't know if you have been in a court, but the court case you're in here is with yourself, actually. You're sitting in the court 
And your conscience is telling you, you know what, what you did just now was a wrong, or you did yesterday, or what you did against somebody, or the story you told about somebody was wrong. That's the accusation you're getting from your conscience. You're in court, and you're going to have to respond to it. You can't ignore it. We ignore our consciences. We get miserable, more and more miserable as we go along. We respond and try and give an answer and depend on our own hearts and minds and thoughts. We also get into trouble and get into a worse state. We who pray about it and read the word and consult the pastor and come to church to find our answer, we make progress in that court case. Not to brag that we won, but that we noticed and we recognized that the accuser was not just yourself. The Holy Spirit came and has been speaking to you. He's always speaking to you. And he's reminding you of your miserable situation, but not with the intention that we think that people often are hunting us down for whatever reason, but with the intention of restoring you back to the image that he gave you, the God-filling image, so that we can also tell others about it. I was going to read a bit of a longer session to you, but I'm going to leave it and just give you a quick abbreviation. In spite of universal sinfulness, well, this is a drastic statement. It's not from me. Okay, I'm not clever enough to say this. I didn't write down who said it. And I'm going to blame him for saying it so that you don't chase me. But in spite of universal sinfulness, which is drastic at the moment, the image of God in man still persists. Okay, that's, that's a statement that you can investigate. Next time I preach, I'll try and help you find the answers better. But if you study that and you really think about it, God has not taken his image away from anybody. As bad as what you might be. We are hearing stories, and not only bad stories going on, but we are hearing stories of people who come to the Lord that you would never have expected. And the people who have led them to the Lord have been surprised at them coming to the Lord because they didn't realize that the image of God still persists. Papua New Guinea, some missionaries reported back there of some of the conversions they had that they just were so astounded at. These are people that are still kind of like in another world. They had to teach them created language for them teach them to use it, and then teach them the message, and they came to the Lord. It took two or three years for that to happen. But they were blessed by it, and they could sense, they told us, well, we got the message that they realized that in these people there's something there. And that something is what I'm trying to say here, is the image of God in man still persists. And some it's more obvious when they become regenerated and sanctified and they follow the Lord and the Lord blesses them and uses them and gives them the opportunity that they need and can use to be a blessing. And I've got to read this verse again. How much more 
will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God. The Old Testament ceremonial cleansing and sacrifices as seen in Numbers 19.13 in, in spiritual terms left the sinner inwardly unchanged. Now that's a drastic statement as far as the cleansing of his sin goes. But as Leon gave us the idea just now, they were having sacrifices all the time. They followed the sacrificial system carefully. They had a ceremony yearly that they would do. Thousands of offerings would go up. And yet the people only sensed a ceremonial or a moral kind of experience from it. They did experience the cleansing of the sin out of their heart. And that's the problem that we have here too. Sacrifices or no sacrifices. That sin in the heart is what has to be dealt with. And that is what our text is telling us. The cleansing of the conscious is only accomplished by the voluntary self-offering of a man who was uniquely both morally perfect without spot and endowed with a divine spirit how much more will the blood of Christ our man who died the only one who could no one else could ever because he was spotless the son of God who through the eternal spirit the eternal spirit the Holy Spirit was Christ's companion, as Mark Jones calls it, throughout his life. And he was always, from the time he was conceived, through his baptism, through the desert, on the cross, the Holy Spirit was with our Savior. Who through the eternal Spirit, Spirit offered himself without blemish to God purifying our conscience from dead works to serve the living God, our Father. How much more? Andrews, he clarifies, this is one of the books that I used, how much more effective is the offering of Christ accompanying two purposes? He summarizes this accomplishment shortly, which will help us understand it a bit better. Objectively, it purifies not the flesh, but the soul, so that the sinner is accepted by the Holy God. The individual sinner is accepted by the Holy God. You can come nearer to God. Not as in the Old Testament. They couldn't even get into the temple. You and I can have contact with God. We have contact. Every day, every moment, we can have contact with God. That is the objective point that he makes because of the purification that we have, not of the flesh, but of the soul. Subjectively, it will cleanse the sinner's conscience that is his inner self. How do I know if the voice is my conscience or the Holy Spirit? How long is my letter of debt? Now you might worry about Is this applicable to me? 
is my sin well, well, those sins that I committed have they been forgiven is this referring to me or am I like the Old Testament people who weren't sure they didn't have the confidence that you should have you can see this image of what's happening what your God did the one you owe everything every single sin you committed if it had to be put on a list and typed out and rolled out and they kept rolling it out and rolling it out because you don't stop sinning and this long list of sins was there that long list of sins has been dealt with it's not lying there in the dustbin or in somebody's record book it's been dealt with look at Colossians chapter 2 you must write this down or put it on your ma mind or in your heart Colossians chapter 2 14 uh, we can start at 13 and you who were dead in your trespasses and uncircumcision of your flesh God made alive together with him having forgiven us all our trespasses by cancelling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands this he set aside nailing it to the cross all of yours he didn't leave any behind they're all there the ones you did beforehand the ones you did today the ones you're going to do tomorrow that's what the Bible promises us that's what the work of the Holy Spirit does in us once we are redeemed once we are a child of God it doesn't mean you're going to got a three road to go sin more now it means that the sins that you do that you don't love doing that you sometimes do because somebody <coughs> crossed you or whatever those are dealt with as well and they've been nailed to the tree been nailed to the cross I cannot in visualizing this it is one of the most beautiful scenes I can see my list of sins has been nailed in fact if I go and look for it now I'm not going to find it there because it's dealt with God has dealt with it I'm freely born again through one who paid the debt the spotless lamb of God First Peter, this is our last reference. We must bring Peter into this because he has so much experience. Anybody could have said, but me, I did it all. I was the greatest and I did the worst of sins. I denied my Savior before he went to the cross. 1 Peter 4.21 Hear what Peter says to us. Is there a 1 Peter 4.21? Is there a 2 Peter 4.21? No. Oops. We're going to have to put that on the next sermon. Just. I can't quite remember the, sermon, the, the thought either. Pray for a good conscience. He encouraged us to do. 321. 321. Oh, okay, there we go. 
She had hopes to have a secretary coming to the service. <laughs> First Peter three twenty one. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Your conscience is included in that text that we doubt today. Your conscience. Covered by Jesus, the Holy Spirit, and the living God. Let your conscience remain in that situation. When you're struggling with your conscience, keep discussing it with the Holy Spirit, the Son, and the Father. You actually are talking to all of them at the same time if you address one. If they're working with you on your problem. And your image is, your godly image is being restored, which was given long ago. Praise the Lord for it, grow in it and trust it, because it's all God's work. May the Lord bless you. And Father, as we go home, may it be that these words hang in our heart, help us to maintain sensitive conscience to your word to your sermons to one another that we will be sensitive of any sins that we commit against each other but particularly against you that all our sins that you have dealt with in the blood of Jesus Christ will be serious in our minds but left over to you and that we can continuously give you thanks in our sacrifices of praise for what you've done. Amen.